Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Jordana Gessler and I'm the Vice President of Education and Exhibits at Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust. It is my pleasure to welcome you this evening to Honoring the Legacies, American Indian Boarding Schools and Intergenerational Trauma, a conversation with Ben Valais, moderated by Marissa Lepore. Today's program is presented by the museum in partnership with 3G at LA Mall, a community for grandchildren of survivors who are helping to shape the future of Holocaust remembrance and education. Silence usually follows traumatic events. Survivors of genocide, violence, and abuse often find it difficult to speak about their experiences. Historically, communities were not interested in airing dirty laundry and further the silence. This has evolved though, and in part to the generations that dig through their family legacy and work to uncover the history that shapes who they are. The third generation is learning to speak freely for their inherited trauma and of the legacy left by their grandparents. The third generation has become a new voice rising to ensure the world continues to learn from the past to inspire a more dignified and humane future. This evening we'll be hearing from Ben who works in people operations at Google and is a member of the leadership council for the Google American Indian Network and the Jugler Group. He was raised in Los, between Los Angeles and Fairbanks, Alaska. Marissa, also raised in Los Angeles, is an investment banker at the Sage Group. In addition to being a 3G at LA Moth board member, Marissa is a member of the Milken Institute's Young Leader Circle, a next-gen board member of Jacobs Jonas Company, and LACMA's avant-garde group. I want to thank Ben for sharing his family story with us this evening and for educating us on a very important history within our culture and community, and Marissa for organizing this program and moderating the conversation with Ben. We will have time for uh, questions at the end of the conversation, so if you have any ideas or thoughts, reflections, questions, please type it into the Q&A box. I will now turn it over to Marissa. Thank you, Jordana. Good evening, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Marissa Lepore. As Jordana said, I'm on the 3G board at LA Moth, and 3G stands for third generation. We're all grandchildren of Holocaust survivors and share a passion for honoring the memories of our grandparents, as well as those of their friends and loved ones who did not survive. As a grandchild of survivors, I grew up hearing about the unfathomable conditions the Jews endured while in concentration camps or in hiding. I can't remember a time when I didn't know about the Holocaust. When I was little, I learned about the numbers tattooed on my papa's arm from Auschwitz, my Bubby's stories of caring for the younger girls in her camp, and why my mom never had her own grandparents, aunts, or uncles. These stories are so ingrained in my childhood. I'm always startled when I find out someone doesn't know about the Holocaust. Or maybe they know about it, but to them it's just data and statistics. That's why I'm so passionate about my role at the museum. We attach stories to history. We bring the enduring trauma of the Holocaust to life, one survivor story at a time. So tonight, I'm proud to introduce my good friend, Ben fate -Velez. Tonight, he'll bring his grandmother, Mary Jane Fate's story to life. And through that, you'll hopefully have a greater understanding of the maltreatment of the Native Americans in the US. To be honest, I recently learned about the Native American boarding schools from Ben and his mother, Jennifer, about a month or so ago. As someone who considers herself extremely well-educated and well-read, I was utterly embarrassed to confess that I never even heard about them. And I know I'm not alone in this. I want to thank Ben for pre preparing an enlightening and informative discussion. Thank you for helping us inspire humanity through truth. It's off to you, Ben. Thank you, Marissa, for that introduction. I'm so honored to be speaking today at LA Moth, and thank you to the 3G group for organizing and allowing me the platform to shed light on what is really a largely unknown part of US history. And today I'm speaking on American Indian boarding schools. The government took tens of thousands of native kids off their reservations and from their villages, including my grandma, to schools where they were required to dress, work, speak, and even pray as mainstream Americans. This program, known as the Federal Indian Boarding School Policy, 
emerged in the late 1850s and endured for over a century until around the late 1950s or so. And these schools were designed to eradicate traditional ways of life. The goal was to civilize and Christianize the natives. And what's important to remember here is that at the time, civility and Christianity meant the same thing. Today, many natives remember these schools as places where they were sexually abused, beaten, silence, and where culture was desecrated. So not once in my elementary or high school education could I remember ever learning about these schools. But what I did know was that my grandmother, Mary Jane Fate, was the first in her bloodline to receive a Western education. And it wasn't until I attended Wesleyan University and sought out courses around colonialization that I learned the true scope of what my grandmother's education truly looked like. My grandma was raised in the village of Rampart, Alaska on the Yukon River. And Rampart's about 60 miles south of the Arctic Circle, right dab in the center of Alaska's interior. When my grandma was 13, federal agents entered Rampart unannounced and started knocking on doors. The story went something like this. These agents entered her home, rounding up my grandmother and her siblings. Some children were even handcuffed. They were marched out of their cabin, the village, and taken on boats to the nearest town. They were met by a plane. They had no idea where they were going or what they were being taken for. All they had, literally, was one another. So when I was 11 years old, I interviewed my grandmother for a fifth grade research project on family history. On August 31st, 1949, my grandmother arrived at Mount Edgecombe Residential Indian Boarding School, thousands of miles away from Rampart. She wrote to me in an email. My grandson, Ben, we were taken to the airport by a stranger in large buses. Everything smelled different. The sounds were foreign to us. Most of us never owned or used a vacuum cleaner. The people were different. It was difficult to understand why we were really here. When will we go home? Where do we sleep or eat or who has the salmon strips, dried meats, snares for getting rabbits? Do we talk or whisper? Where's my Indian slippers? I remember that we were all very quiet and my only thought was that our parents wanted us to have an education, which they never had the opportunity to have. I thought I better look happy and positive and try to be a big sister friend because I saw in the faces of hundreds of younger kids some fear, loneliness, and confusion. Although we did not have a quality education like you are getting today, our parents and us students did not have the years we should have had with our parents. Most all of us never had the choice to return home or had both parents when we were home. So the absence of children in these villages produced community trauma that extends far beyond the schools themselves. The effects are systemic and they seep from generation to generation. The impact of assimilation permeates as survivors of these schools often turn to drugs, alcohol, and suicide to cope with the immense voids this policy produced. The wounds inflicted remain unhealed and have, to have adopted a very threatening legacy of silence. To this day, I know very little of my great grandfather, Tom. What I do know is in line with these lasting effects. Growing up, I was told Grandpa Tom became very sad when his children left. I was told he drank. I was told he was depressed. I was told Mount Edgecombe would not let my grandmother attend his funeral. And I've been told nothing more. So today, the question that I'm setting up to answer is, what were these Indian boarding schools? What did they look like? How did the federal government get away with this abuse for over a century? And why don't we know about them? For some historical context, if the former approach to the Indian problem, think manifest destiny and forced removal, was violent extermination and displacement, the 1850s marked a reformist approach of discipline and assimilation. The curriculum and agenda of these boarding schools sought to pass students through a state of what some call social death. In other words, for natives to develop a reformed American subjectivity. In effect, the objective of the boarding school became the absolute assimilation and acculturation of the Indian into dominant society. And there was really a long-term blueprint here too. The obedience the schools aimed to impose prepared students for the subordination they would experience when they had completed their education 
and entered the social ranks of American society. Boarding schools trained students in manual labor, in farming and domestic work, where the underlying goal was to assimilate the natives into the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder upon graduation. In this way, the boarding school policy really grew out of federal self-interest, where the demand for economic gain and total ownership over Indian land and resources prompted the structural reform to the Indian problem. Put differently, because terminating Indian existence became increasingly impossible in 20th century America, the physical genocide of natives involved into another kind of genocide, a cultural genocide by way of acculturation and forced assimilation. Indian boarding schools were meticulously engineered to systematically eradicate indigenous culture through generations. When these schools were first being implemented, the federal government imposed boarding school policies on the most hostile tribes. Federal agents would target the most rebellious leaders and legally abduct their children as a sanctioned form of kidnapping. The idea here was to keep these communities pacified as their children are kept far away and in the government's hands. Remote locations for these schools made it impossible for students to visit home at any point, rarely even in the summer, where social matriculation internships then prevented students from returning home even after graduation. So if the overarching goal in assimilating the native was to instill obedience, the boarding school's entire structure and curriculum supported this idea. And it's really fascinating when you see how the physical form of these schools followed their function. Every tribal nation across the US and indigenous group varies culturally, but it's true that there's a common denominator, which is the relationship to land. It's one marked by mutual respect and preservation. In Western cultures, humanity has consistently sought to take control of nature. The first couple of boarding schools that emerged in the 19th century all had massive manicured gardens. Organized landscaping became the introduction to society. Students would act as groundskeepers to teach them that nature exists to serve man's end. General Richard Pat Pratt, who was a Southern general who lived in the 19th century, designed the first Indian boarding school known as the Carlisle Industrial School. He wrote about how landscaping at his school would impress notions of order and symmetry in the minds of Indian youth. Pratt is most famously quoted to have said, kill the Indian, save the man. But perhaps more pertinent here was what he announced sometime later, which was the wild must be tamed just as the Indian must be civilized. In a personal account, a survivor at the Wrangell Institute, which was the largest and perhaps most infamous boarding school in Alaska, outlined the degrading and dehumanizing process that each student was subject to once they arrived. This process was highly scalable and mechanical and acted almost like a factory of sorts. After traveling immense distances by planes, boats, buses, even sometimes dog sleds, students were told to strip naked and place all belongings into a bag. Students were then lined up for military style haircuts. Students were then taken to chemical baths to clean up where the acids that they were forced to bathe in were painful and irritating. After being given government issued clothes, students were assigned numbers as a form of identification and at some schools were also assigned a new name, a Western name. This process represented a tangible assimilation into Western culture where native individuality was physically being stripped from bodies. Many of you are familiar with the abuse Jews experienced upon entering the concentration camps and these similarities are not coincidental. The Nazis studied these tactics and implemented them against Jews about a century later. And this is really just the tip of the iceberg here. The Nazis modeled so much of their political infrastructure around US policies. In Mein Kampf, Hitler discusses US law and policies and outright wrote that the United States was a racial model for Europe and that it was the quote, one state in the world that was creating the kind of racist society that the Nazi regime wanted to establish. The Nazis were very interested in how the United States had gotten away with discriminating against minorities for several centuries using law predicated on race and bloodlines. Some scholars even argue that the 1935 Nuremberg, Nuremberg laws wouldn't have been nearly as effective had it not been for their extensive research on American Indian policy. And in 1928 speech, Hitler stated that Americans had, quote, gunned down the millions of redskins to a few hundred thousand and now keep the modest remnant under observation in a cage. So life at these boarding schools 
was organized like military schools. The military connotes virtues of obedience, neatness, politeness, self-confidence, patriotism, really the exact ideologies that these schools enforced. At Mount Edgecombe Boarding School, my grandmother's school, they divided the students into what they literally called battalions, specifically breaking up the kids from the same tribe. By segregating the students, the schools effectively obstructed the students' ability to practice their languages, directly leading to the extinction of many native languages. It's also interesting to see how they taught the notion of time, because in villages long ago, time was never structured around a clock. The schools taught this idea of time with bells, where ringing signaled everything from when to wake, sleep, eat, show up, even sit. Again, the idea here being that if the being that if time is a primary means of teaching punctuality and promptness, then civility would be soon to follow. The most concerning aspect of how these schools functioned as military schools was surely the implementation of the court martial format. The brightest and most obedient students were rewarded with leadership positions on student councils, where they were tasked with determining punishments. This format was constructed to oppose the students against one another rather than the administration, and again, You'll notice here the parallels between this and the concentration camps. Ultimately, of course, the administration wielded absolute power, ignoring the decisions made by student leadership. It was also commonplace for faculty to beat their students. Many teachers thought of their positions not so much as teacher of materials and lessons as we know them, but as teachers of civility, that they were trained to think that civility was best imposed through violence, that natives couldn't be reached in any other way than physical abuse and corporal punishments. One respondent um, from Ray Engel Institute stated that faculty regularly carried around razor straps, and if students spoke their native tongue, they'd get swatted 10 times. While boys were subject to violence, girls were most often subject to measures of ridicule, ridicule told to cut grass with scissors or wear degrading signs such as I ran away, or be assigned extra strenuous domestic roles. Girls who spoke in their native tongue were made to brush their teeth with harsh lao soap. Girls were also predominantly the victims of what was known as the outing program, where for girls to be fully assimilated into housewifery, an education through labor was supposedly necessary. My grandma was part of this program while at school and it functioned almost identically to the Spanish colonial repartmento system, subjecting girls into forced domestic labor where part of the slim earnings the girls received would then go back to the boarding schools as payment for their education. Students who were assigned outings were sent to live and work as housekeepers with white suburban middle-class families during the summer months. My grandmother was assigned in Fairbanks, Alaska. According to Richard Pratt, the guy who designed these schools, this system, quote, fostered the acquisition of English, enabled them to earn money and broke down prejudice. Indians came to appreciate the goodwill of their white patrons, while patrons gained an increased appreciation of the Indians' capabilities. This system soon expanded, where boys then began to work on farms and in factories. So in a way, it's fair to say that boarding schools were also used as a smokescreen for forced labor across the nation. Taken as a whole, these boarding schools were overcrowded dumps, exploited for economic gain, and used as modalities of subordination. As illness spread, the federal government launched health campaigns designed to blame the school's lack of hygiene on the savage ways of the Indians themselves. Extremely ill-equipped to handle disease, schools would return fatally ill students to their homes where the blatant lack of medicine and doctors meant their imminent deaths. In turn, schools were effectively able to shake liability for their own abuse and maltreatment. This reality of death by disease coupled with the physical violence and the trauma of the many, many, many reported sexual assaults and rape made for a miserable atmosphere that resulted in severe depression for many and heavily impacted the communities from which they came once and if the student returned home. At Nome Belts, an Alaska Native boarding school located way up north, nine students committed suicide in one year. When you think about all the alcoholism and deaths that resulted from trauma that these schools imposed, you start to see how cultural genocide continues to produce death. In 2014, Anchorage Dispatch News, which is kind of like the LA Times of Alaska, reported that Alaska natives below the age of 29 commit suicide at a rate nine times higher than the national average. In this way, there might not be a degree of genocide, if that makes sense. 
like genocide is genocide because the line between cultural genocide and physical genocide starts to blur and thin. When students began graduating from boarding schools in greater numbers, resistance towards this federal policy started to grow. As early as the 1890s, parents heard of the trauma and suffering that students underwent, the realization of boarding schools as yet another persistent hegemonic assault on the Indian cultural identity forced tribal communities to grasp the immense threat that Western education posed to the traditional ways. The poor health conditions at the schools, resulting in the large number of deaths, obviously became the primary reason for the opposition. Banning together entire tribes started to, enroll, started to refuse to enroll their children in the schools. Because each boarding school had quotas, however, this resistance was met with harshness as federal agents forcefully began entering camps and reservation and seizing children unwilling, unwillingly. To, situ to situate all of this within my family's history, my grandma went to boarding school around this time and was one of the children that was more forcibly taken. While some parents took their children into hiding, others offered orphans in place of their own kids. For the Navajo, resistance became actually very strategic. The federal government engaged tribal policemen, members of the community themselves, to help with the rounding up of their own children. In these instances, tribal police chose to abduct the black sheep of the tribe, avoiding the prime, those who were intelligent, physically able, well taken care of, literally resisting schools by inflicting a sort of social Darwinism within their own communities to survive. Within the schools themselves, resistance gained attraction, as students would often take any chance to escape. Because superintendents pedagogically imposed a fear of being captured, students who escaped did so during these outing programs. Another interesting form of re resistance was the dividing up of the school into battalions that I mentioned earlier. And although the goal was to make language and culture impossible to practice, these battalions ironically contributed to a form of resistance through cultural preservation. Even with language barriers, students formed a pan-tribal identity engaging in clandestine acts of cultural pre preservation by sharing folk tales, legends, and stories passed down from their elders late at night. And this resistance continued in the way natives thought of themselves and their own education. When I wrote a paper in college on all of this, one of my interviewees who went to a boarding school said to me, learning something about the white man's language and life ways did not necessitate a wholesale abandonment of one's Indian self. But differently, the accommodation of the white man's teaching did not mean the surrender of the native identity. The two ways of being can powerfully coexist. And in the years that followed the policy's end, we start to see a strategic cohort of native leaders emerging in the Western world. A generation of natives that could hold their own out on the river practicing subsistence fishing, but also hold their own in the conference room a generation of folks who were charged and empowered to fight for native rights, weaponizing the forced assimilation they experienced against their own oppressors. And my grandma was part of this generation. It's who she was. She was top of her class at boarding school and went on to be one of the first Alaska natives to attend university. She worked hard. She moved to Fairbanks, far from the native villages, and she met my grandpa. She led a life best defined as one foot in the Western world and one in the native world. She became a well-known champion for Alaska native rights. She became co-chair of the Alaskan Federation of Natives, the largest political body for natives in Alaska, went on to be a founding member of the North American Indian Women's Association and served on the board of Alaska Airlines for over two decades. But despite her success in the business world, she never lost sight of who she was or where she came from. Grandma returned home every summer to her land on the Yukon, just next to Rampart. And every summer since I was born, we joined her, my grandparents, my brothers, my parents, cousins, aunties, and uncles, practicing the same subsistence salmon fishing that she was taught as a child many, many years ago. My grandma successfully channeled her experience into a very purposeful action and passed her tradition on to the next generation. And if that's not successful resistance, I truly don't know what is. So that's a little bit of history and context of the American Indian boarding school policy. And now I think we're going to move over to some Q&A. Yes, thank you so much, Ben. 
Um, well, you know that we have a few questions prepared and I also want to prepare the audience to start submitting some of their questions to the chat and then we will um, select some of the audience questions as well. So, you know, as a grandchild of Holocaust survivors, I know how hard it was for them to share their stories because they didn't want us, their grandchildren or even their children to experience their trauma and they didn't want to relive those traumatic experiences either. When they did tell us about the Holocaust or you know, what happened to their family, they often had nightmares. How did you learn about these stories from your grandmother? And was it hard for her to share them with you? You know, it's such an interesting question because like being of Alaska Native descent, but then also Jewish descent, I looked to my father's side and the stories that my great aunt and my grandfather had of the Holocaust are written down and we all know them and we talk about them at the dinner table. It's kind of like commonplace knowledge in the family. But on my grandma's side, like as I mentioned in my, in my talk, we didn't know much and it, like things were very seldom discussed. And I think it's because there's this kind of like shadow of silence in native communities. And silence is not only part of the cultural fabric of who we are, but I also understand silence is kind of a detriment, but also a powerful weapon in the sense that when students were at these boarding schools, by remaining silent, they were actually preserving their own culture. They weren't opening themselves up to harsh punishment by you know, speaking their native tongue. They were able to kind of hold on to what they learned as kids before going to boarding school. But on the other hand, once they left boarding schools, by not talking about some of the trauma that they experienced, which is just the native way, I think that it was a detriment to healing in a sense as well. I think that's, that's actually a great segue to, to my next question because as Ben said, I want to remind everyone that Ben's paternal grandfather, Robert, was from Switzerland. And while he was lucky enough to escape before the war, many of his family members, unfortunately, were not. And although, Ben, it seems like you grew up knowing a lot about your grandfather's family and what happened during the Holocaust, since you know there's that culture of silence that permeated through um, your mom's side of the family, what, was there a time when you realized that a lot of the tactics that were used against your mom's side of the family and your dad's side of the family were similar? And, you know, how did, how did that make you feel? Or do you remember? Yeah, it was actually quite recent. Um, Cause as I said, like a lot of this stuff isn't taught in, you know, edu in early education or high school. Um, I studied indigenous politics in college and American studies. And I think that, um, that was when I first realized that not only tactics of subordination and oppression are used across countries and borders, but they all kind of stem from colonialization in a way. And it's this idea of understanding colonialization more so as like a process rather than like a one-off event. And when you start to understand colonialization as a series of steps, such as indigenous people experience here in America, you start to see that these are actually more like a different tactics of oppression are systemic and they can be learned and taught, right? So like if you're trying to subordinate a certain group of people, you can come up with your own plan or just open up a history book and learn to see what other people did. So all this to say that the world is just so interconnected and the hor horrific things that have occurred in this world are never necessarily, they're never just standing on their own, you know, like everything builds off of one another or they come from some place and they'll expand or take it in a different direction. Yeah, and I think that that's really important and also brings us back to the museum's kind of goal of inspiring humanity through truth and really, you know, taking our time to learn truth and learn what happened to all different people around the world because, you know, in some ways had we known about what happened in the US and maybe what happened in other countries, you know, whether it was during the Holocaust, and I know these tactics were used in other places at other times as well, could have been altered or, you know, even prevented. 
And, you know, I think it's important to recognize that simultaneous to the Native American boarding schools, we also had slavery of African Americans in the US, which had been institutionalized for centuries. Do you think that American citizens, and it seems like you do because of, you know, what we were just talking about, but that American citizens were somewhat desensitized to what was happening at the boarding schools because they were so used to slavery and the dehumanization of people and thinking of people as kind of other or, you know, people, beings who could perform tasks for them? Or were citizens not even aware that these schools were happening outside of the families who were receiving um, you know, those outing benefits. I guess. You mean just like the general American public? Yeah. yeah. Um, that's also a great question because I think that by this time, the whole myth of like the Indian being extinct was already a part of our cultural uh, understanding, right? Like an interesting thing I learned in school was if you're ever in New England and you see like first church of blah, 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 or like last national bank or things like that, those words are actually very intentionally put there to imply that there, there was nothing there before them. And what I'm trying to say with that is that there was this understanding that Indians had already been extinct, right? Like they had already been eradicated. So conversations around indigenous people like never made it to the mainstream. It still doesn't today. And I'm not actually quite sure like what, awareness was had at the time, but it surely was not front page news by any means. And then the other side of that question that I think is fascinating is that we look back on this and we're like, what is going on, right? Like this is an atrocity, oh my God, which it absolutely is. But at the time, and I'm talking like 1850s around then, um, Richard Pratt, who's the guy, he's a Southern general, he designed the first school, he's kind of responsible for the development of them and all that. He was actually viewed as incredibly progressive in a way. Um, people really viewed natives as actually subhuman back then, and they didn't think that they could be assimilated into American mainstream culture. So for Richard Pratt to stand up and say, hey, I'm actually going to create a boarding school where we're going to just bring natives into hegemonic American society. Everyone kind of thought he was actually out of his mind and that he wouldn't get anywhere with this program. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely not saying like no native thought of him as progressive, but within his networks and within his communities on a federal level, he was actually viewed as like championing, championing native rights really interesting and it shows kind of the importance of the people that you surround yourself by and you know, the importance of talking to people with, with different opinions um, for sure. I think um, you know it seems although most people didn't know about the boarding schools it seems and you know if anything it seems like Richard Pratt as you were saying could be viewed as you know, a champion or someone taking a risk on, you know, these people, which obviously is a crazy way to look at it now. Um, pretty insane that that's how people were viewing it then, but there were a lot of crazy things that happened in the past. Um, so, you know, it seems like some families were involved because there were families who benefited from the work of the outings. And could you share a little bit more about your grandmother's experience with dealing with those outing families? And, you know, what did the family she worked for think of the boarding school system, if, if she remembered or if she told you about it? Yeah, um, so my grandmother did her outing program after graduating from Mount Edgecombe Bay, and she worked for um, a white family in Fairbanks, Alaska, where she later spent her whole life and where my mother was raised. Um, and, you know, to go back to my earlier point, like history doesn't include these stories, um, like ever really, even when I've done extensive research on a lot of this for many different projects and you have to really dig in archives to find anything. And even when you do, it's often in the back section of some very old ar archival, um, kind of like cassette tapes kind of thing. And so I, I know from my, from my own family history, uh, my grandmother did not have the best experience. I know that the mother of the household 
my grandmother was a very, very beautiful woman. And I know that the mother of the household um, thought that like her husband was in love with her or something. And she experienced like a lot of animosity uh, eventually left, I believe. Um, I don't know the exact specifics, but if there are stories that are told of these outing programs, they're passed down through oral histories in a way, like from one generation to the next and not so much written in any kind of uh, history or textbook. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah, totally. I think, you know, there's a lot of parallels between that and the righteous Gentiles who helped save Jews during the Holocaust, whether they were, you know, having them in hiding or helping them escape or, you know, helping them get papers. And over time, those stories get uncovered. But I know that in the same way, you know, it's not documented because the whole point was that it was secret. So, you know, unless people come forward or unless those stories get get announced at some point, it's just, you know, heroicism that kind of goes unnoticed, but I guess, yeah, kind of I like think a true hero. Another thing to mention there is, like, because these boarding schools, and especially the outing program, like these things operated for over the course of a whole century, and they took on so many different forms, right? So what my grandmother experienced in the way that it was executed, was very likely very different from someone who went to Mount Edgecombe a generation before her, and then maybe worlds different from someone, you know, who is from the lower 48 who went to a boarding school like just a mile away from their from their reservation. So the nuances, I'm sure are immense. There's just not really kind of like centralized uh, recording of this stuff. I know that in Canada, they've done a much better job. Um, they have a specific section of their government specifically devoted to gathering, collecting, and then building reparations for survivors of sexual assault and rape from these schools. Um, but it's not something that's been done in the US yet. Really interesting. Going to kind of the preservation of culture and in some ways how silence helped preserve the culture of um, the students who were in the schools. It reminded me of one of my Bubby stories from when she was in the concentration camp. And often in the concentration camps, Jews secretly upheld their customs and holidays, even risking death to do so. And I always remember a story that she told me. And when she was in a forced labor camp, she and some of her friends knew that it was Yom Kippur. How they knew, I honestly, I still don't even know. I, in COVID, I have trouble keeping track of the days. So I really don't know how they kept track of the Jewish calendar. Um, but anyway, they knew it was Yom Kippur and they didn't eat to honor the holiday. And when the Nazis noticed that they were saving their bread rather than eating it immediately, one of them questioned why. And one of the women who was not my bubby said that they were fasting to honor the Jewish holiday of Yom Kippur, you know, the most holy day of the year. And at that time, my bubby was silent. And the woman who spoke was murdered immediately. And the other women who were silent were punished and were forced to fast for another day. They were told that they must be fed too much. And, you know, in that case, you know, the silence was detrimental at the time. They were completely malnourished and to be prevented food for another day is just, you know, it's hard to even imagine. But I guess their silence led to their survival and they ultimately, you know, preserved the culture. And I grew up celebrating all the holidays with her. So in that way, you know, the culture and traditions continued. But does your grandmother have any stories of an instance like that where she was trying to uphold her family customs and she was punished or she witnessed someone punished for that? That's a powerful story, Marissa. I think as it applies to my mother's side of the family, a lot of that comes out in the way that my brothers and I were raised. Um, we've been going to our fish camp on the Yukon River where we do all this subsistence fishing every single summer since I was born. and. There is such a process to doing the traditional way of fishing. It requires hours and hours of preparation, days of preparation, frankly. And then once you're out on the river, you have to be so careful because there's no hospital you know, around. Like if you get hurt, we're using big tools. Like you have to be super, super careful. And 
growing up, it was always so interesting to me, interesting to me to see how there, I'm not going to say there was little trust, but there was definitely kind of control over uh, the means or the methods of fishing. And I think that was because there was such importance paid to um, the actual process itself in that like my grandmother and my grandpa understood that if we were going to successfully carry on this tradition, they needed to always teach us by showing and not just telling us to do something and going to do it. Um, and that remains true today. Like just this, just a couple of weeks ago, we brought my 90 year old grandpa uh, out to the Yukon. Unfortunately, my, my grandma passed away earlier this year. Um, but you know, he's, he's 90, he can barely walk. And even then he refuses to let me screw on the gas tank because uh, he needs to be the one to do it. Because otherwise, you know, when he's gone one day, I won't know how to successfully uh, pick up the reins. So it's it's kind of like the little ways in which we we live up there that lay claim to that um, idea of kind of like pre preserving culture, I think. Um, but as it relates to my grandmother's upbringing, she always had a very long-term vision. And that has always been clear to me. My mom, my aunties, like she, everything she did was in service of her community, in service of her family, uh, being a mother and a grandma. And that's how she kind of connected to culture. Because maybe, you know, she was on the student council while she was at Mount Edgecombe and she was being obedient and doing X, Y, and Z. But more than that, like she had a long term plan for how she would then be able to one day not just give back to us, but the greater community at large, too. It's really interesting um, that you say that because I know from, you know, growing up with your family when you talk about going to fish camp, I think that's what you call it, right? Um, it's almost seems like a very sacred tradition and almost it's not religious, but it has like a similar undertone in a way that, you know, I would celebrate Passover or something, the annual thing that you do every year. And it's a big family event and it brings you together. And I think it's a really beautiful tradition. So my last question for you before we open it up to some of the audience questions, and I can see them flowing in, is about intergenerational trauma. And I know that that's a theme that's been kind of an undertone to today's conversation, but I wanna bring it a little bit more into the forefront. So, you know, in my family, intergenerational trauma has manifested in many ways, and it's not all bad. Um, my mom and I both had somewhat irrational fears of our parents dying when we were little, you know, and I think that there's definitely a fear of being taken away from your parents that, you know, we probably got from, you know, my grandparents, her parents. Um, we also need to have more than enough food at all times, which made us very good at preparing for the COVID shortages. And um, in a more positive light, we feel a strong need to care for those without parents or when we recognize that someone doesn't seem to have a community or is maybe a new person in a new city, among other things. So, and when speaking with other 3Gs, and remember that's third generation Holocaust survivors, it seems like they've experienced something similar um, and have related to their parents about that too. Have you noticed any particular fears or anxieties among your mom, aunts, or your cousins that permeate throughout your guys' lives? Yeah, inter intergenerational trauma is a big one. Um, it's something that comes from both sides of the family, as you also know well. I think the biggest, when I think intergenerational trauma, um, I think of the silence primarily, because we have this word in Athabascan, um, which is specifically like when we say Alaska Native, like I'm Alaska Native, but I'm at the Baskin. It's a region with the Indians of the Koyukon region of the interior. We say this word Haklani, which is kind of like, uh, there's not really a direct translation, but it's similar like taboo. And it's a word that's used quite intentionally, I think, in Native Alaskan communities, especially at the Baskin culture, which essentially goes to mean, uh, like, let's not talk about that. Like that shouldn't be talked, that shouldn't be brought up right now. And it's interesting because I think that the trauma that extends from one generation to the other 
is often carried on via silence in a way that goes back to the point that you were making, I think. Um, people aren't so willing to talk about their experiences and what happened at these schools or what happened just in general, in the community or at life. And it's, it's scary, I think. And as much as um, we're, I think that we're slowly arriving at a place where, like, you know, just me doing this talk is kind of like breaking within that tradition, but um, I'm excited for how we can further unpack this notion of being more open. And then the other side of intergenerational trauma, which is maybe the more uplifting side, is just the understanding of like where we came from and what our ancestors and elders went through so that we could be where we are today. And for me personally, what that means is never forgetting to give back to those communities. Um, for my grandma, her mandate, her mission in life was education. She worked tirelessly to secure a better education for Alaska Native children in particular. And that's something that my brothers and I have carried with us to this day, and that we will always hold near in whatever we do in life, that idea of giving back. Yeah, it's really interesting that you focus on education because I've interviewed a lot of survivors, you know, aside from my grandparents, and education is something that it's a theme that permeates throughout every discussion that I have, regardless of how old they were at the time of the Holocaust or what they did in their life after. And it's just, they focus on it so much because it's the one thing that can never be taken away. And I think that, you know, focusing on education, not only of, you know, people and making sure that they have the education to be successful in their lives and access new opportunities, but also the education to prevent atrocities like, you know, the Native American boarding schools or what happened to Native Americans on a larger scale or the Holocaust or all these other atrocities that happened in the past um, is so important. And I think that perfectly segues us to some of our questions. And there's a few questions that are similar, so I'll summarize it a little bit, but, um, you know, very much a topic of conversations right now is education for kids of all ages, even college students, and what those curriculums look like. And you and I uh, both acknowledge that we never learned about the Native American boarding schools in our education. So, you know, on a smaller scale, is there anything that Alaska has done to implement more education on the Native American boarding schools in public schools and private schools? And then, you know, also on a broader scale, if you know about that. There definitely has. Um, I was up in Alaska last year working with a bunch of kids from, um, from villages from all over, really. And part of their education in villages now includes coursework on the history of Alaska Natives, which of course includes that history on Indian boarding schools, um, which I just loved to hear because at least that they're learning about um, more than, they're learning more than just what the stories that are told from one generation to the next. Learning something in a classroom setting, I think, carries a, a weight with it. Um, and then beyond that, I know that there are a lot of different communities across the United States that help survivors of these schools cope with that trauma. Um, I'm not sure how they're funded or where the funding comes from, but there are now resources that are helping that next generation uh, kind of navigate the impact of what their ancestors endured. Um, and I think another interesting point there um, is that there's still, I think there's a lot of like revisionist history to be done, done with this because I don't like, it's, it's shocking to me that this is not a part of like an AP US history curriculum and maybe it is, but it's not, we don't really thoroughly unpacked in the way that it should be. Um, and of course there are probably reasons for that, but um, holistically Alaska, I think has done a good job of putting this history in museums um, as well as just kind of making it more commonplace understanding, but that's just Alaska. I don't think the same could be said with California where there were also many Indian boarding schools. Yeah, and I think, you know, um, I don't remember learning about it either. And even with the Holocaust, it's more taught in schools, but I remember it's kind of like one day where it's brought up and there's a lot of figures and you hear that six million Jews were murdered. And then, you know, 
you move on to D-Day and other things and it kind of trickles off. And so I think, you know, one of the big mission, missions of the museum is to have, is about education and having students from all over LA come to the museum and hear from a real Holocaust survivor and just bring like, as I was saying at the beginning, the data and statistics to a more personal and emotional level because sometimes it's really, it's a lot easier to understand what happened when you hear individual stories rather than just, you know, a timeline of events. Um, and so hopefully that, that can be, you know, more prevalent among uh, the Native American communities as well. Another question that we received from Rachel is, you mentioned that your grandmother attended college. Since these schools were designed to keep natives on the lower level of the socioeconomic ladder, what was the process like for your grandmother to make it to college? Could you speak about that more? Yeah, um, I think my grandmother, so she enrolled in the University of Alaska Fairbanks to study accounting. And at the time, she was one of the first Alaska Natives, not to mention one of the very first Alaska Native women to do so. And I think the, the goal there was no different than any other uh, you know, minority in the US where that American dream, right? Like going and working hard and getting the education to then get a job somewhere to earn money. Um, in terms of the process itself, the University of Alaska at Fairbanks has quite, it now does, has quite a substantial native population just because it's in Alaska's interior. Um, and there are a lot of native folks that live in Fairbanks too. Um, but the process, I'm not, I'm not quite sure um, like what that process for her looks like, but I know that having attended university, she was able to then go on and do what many of her um, relatives might not have been able to do without an education, which was really kind of like create, not only have a voice, but ha have the knowledge to create a voice for herself in, in business settings. Um, and then she, she also worked a lot in public policy later in life, specifically for Alaska Native. She was one of the lobbyists in DC who lobbied for the Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act, which was um, Alaska's extinguishment of land title for indigenous people, which is kind of this historic um, claim settlement, which might be another talk in and of itself. But um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, and I think I'm going to ask a follow-up question of my own related to that. And you mentioned in your speech that your grandmother was really skilled at navigating both the Native world and the Western world and that really allowed her to excel in both communities and earn a lot of respect from the people who were around her. Do you remember her talking about anything or, you know, a story where she was kind of had one foot in one world and one foot in the other? That's such a great question because, you know, growing up, it, I didn't quite realize how unique that was. Um, it was just like who my grandma was, right? Like we'd go fishing with her in the summer and then I would see her getting all dressed up to fly to DC for meetings. Mm -hmm. And um, she, she was such an interesting person, but her, I don't know, her, the ambition for walking between both worlds was almost like natural in a sense to her. Um, yeah, I think that answered that, I'm not sure. It yeah. reminds earlier this morning I was listening to a webinar with Nelson Mandela's grandson. So it's been a little bit of a theme of grandchildren honoring their grandparents' legacies. And he was talking about Nelson Mandela's um, how he studied Afrikaans to understand like the language of his oppressor. Mm -hmm. And I it just really paralleled what your grandmother was doing because instead of rejecting Western culture, she tried to understand it and respect it and figure out ways to integrate it into her own Absolutely. life. And in doing so, she was not only respected by the leaders of Western culture, but she was also able to help her own community, which made her even more powerful and more impactful in her own society. So she was really so successful at change from within, if that makes sense. Like she really knew how to influence. And I think that was one of her biggest skills. Uh, but to go back to your question, I heard so much growing up about what it was like for her to be a woman in these in these in these settings, um, especially in corporate settings. 
like that seemed to be always more top of mind for her in a way, at least from my position, I'm sure my mom might have a different perspective, but um, then it was like being, um, you know, just navigating being both in the Western and Native world. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely interesting. And I've seen pictures of her and she's very beautiful. So I'm sure she she's captured pretty. people's attention in the room. She did. Um, before we wrap up, there's, you know, there's been questions about, you know, if the U.S. has done anything, and I think the answer is kind of, um, but based on what you've said, but maybe you can elaborate on that a little bit more, you know, if there's any reparation, formal acknowledgement, you know, mm -hmm. any sort of apology? There's been um, reparation, no. Well, as it relates to the boarding schools, no. But there has been acknowledgement of it. I think that, um, I, b I believe Bill Clinton was the first president to acknowledge um, the boarding schools. And there was kind of an apology that came with it. Um, but there, I mean, there just has not been an overarching reparative kind of like system that's come into play as it relates to this. I know that um, while the boarding schools themselves don't exist anymore, there are, they've taken different forms. And what's interesting is that the boarding schools themselves way back then took a different form because originally they were missionary schools, which then evolved into federal Indian boarding schools. And now there's a new version of that, which is also funded by the federal government. Um, but I, I think that there's many different systems in place, such as the Indian healthcare system, which try to speak to these different pain points that have, came, that have come as a result of Indian boarding school policy. Um, but in terms of like, one devoted branch or committee working towards uncovering the trauma and then finding solutions for enabling healment that's not been done such as it has in Canada and other places in the world yeah Interesting. thank you so you know I think we're right on schedule which is great but I'll just wrap up with one last question which is I think there's a lot of people who've learned about this for the first time and I think this was a great introduction for them to inspire them to learn more and figure out more of, you know, about a history that they didn't previously know about. And, you know, I want to thank you and your family for sharing all these stories with me over the past month or so. I think it was um, coincidental that around when you told me this story and you were talking about your grandmother and we were talking about her specifically because she unfortunately recently passed away, I had been reading a book called This Tender Land, which happened to be about the uh, boarding schools. And so everything kind of tied in together so well. And I had another context for the discussion, but that book is fiction, although based on um, true stories. Do you have any recommended, recommend, recommended reading for people to you know, start educating themselves? Or I know there was a podcast you were listening to. Um, I think people can kind of take away from this other than today's discussion. Yeah, um, you know, this thing happened for over the course of a century. So it's hard to find a point of entry with this topic other than just Googling American Indian Boarding School. But I always tell people start with the Carlisle Industrial Boarding School. That was the first one. It was probably the most disgusting boarding school there was. They actually discovered burial grounds uh, with children's bodies inside of them um, as recently as just a couple of years ago, actually. But if you start there and you start to understand where the motivation and design that came from, that will lead you in other directions, which will point you to other topics I think that you can learn more from. Also, I would, um, in terms of the intersection between what I was talking about and concentration camps in Nazi Germany, a great book, I'm forgetting the name, but it's written by John Tolland. Um, and he specifically writes <clears throat> on the adoption of federal Indian policy um, that Hitler essentially was so interested in. So the author again's name was John Tolland and I'm completely forgetting the book's name, but he's a good resource. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Ben, for doing this today and sharing your family stories, both your grandmother's and your grandfather's stories. And it's been truly a pleasure, you know, learning about it from you and working together on this. So thank you so much. I'll turn it back over to the museum. Thank you, Marissa.
Wow, I think I echo everyone who joined us this evening when I say thank you, Ben, for sharing such a poignant and important history and Marissa for bringing this program to life. There's so much more healing to be done and learning for us to do. Before we sign off, I want to invite everyone to join us again for one of our future programs. Next Tuesday, August 4th at 11 a.m. Pacific time, join us for our monthly series, Building Bridges, in partnership with the Jewish Center for Justice, Los Angeles Urban League, Hope and Cause. Our board member, Dan Schnur, will moderate a discussion with next-gen leaders of those organizations about working together to fight hatred. You can find more information about all of our virtual events on our website, lamoth.org. The museum provides online programs like today's at no charge. If you're enjoying our programs and learning from them, please consider supporting our work by making a donation at lamoth.org. Thank you again, Ben and Marissa, and to everyone for joining us this evening. Take care, stay safe, and we hope to see you again soon.